Well, last week we took a little survey about voting. Voting as a believer is a privilege and it's also our responsibility uh, to vote for bi biblical values. And so uh, Christian pastors across the nation are, are working that Christians are registered to vote and that they vote uh, when it's time to vote, and they vote according to Christian values. So we took a survey last week and asked everyone anonymously. The first question was, are you registered to vote? And 95% were. So let's give ourselves a hand. That's pretty good. And those that moved and haven't registered yet, please, please get registered while you're thinking about it. Okay, the 5%. Uh, the second question is, did you vote this week? And... Drum roll, 81%. Give yourself a hand, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. Actually, the national goal is 75%. I mean, I think that's a little low. I think we can get it up to 90%. Um, so if you didn't vote, why not? Okay, here were some of the reasons. Uh, I was busy. Is that a good reason? I'm sorry, I'm sorry if you put that down, but uh, we need to plan and we need to make voting a priority. Now, I realize some people said they were traveling and that, that can become an issue if you, something unexpected happens and you're out of town. Uh, that's one of the, perhaps one of the reasons you can't get around. But if you know you're going to be traveling, there is such a thing called an absentee ballot. I know it's a little of a pain to get one, but it's possible to do that as well if you know you're going to be traveling. Uh, another uh, reason was I, I couldn't get to the polls. Well, ask somebody to help you. You know, if you're in a life group, at, let somebody know or ask somebody in church. Ask them, say, I don't have a way to get to the polls. Uh, ask somebody, and I'm sure somebody uh, will help you. Uh, another reason why some, uh, some people didn't vote is they didn't feel there was anything important on the ballot, important to them. And I would just say that every election is important. You need to get informed uh, about who the candidates are, what the issues are. Uh, some people said they didn't know how to vote, so they didn't vote. And um, perhaps we need to do a better job uh, as a church informing you about the issues, the relevance of the issues, and, and really what is a biblical stance on them. And we hope to do that better before the next election. But it's important for everyone to vote, even if, you know, there are some questions that might be a little gray and you could go this way or that way but there's other things I'd say 80 to 90 percent things on the ballot if you really understand the issues and understand the candidates it's pretty much black and white uh, for a biblical vote according to biblical values and so uh, let's give ourselves a hand though that's pretty good that's pretty good I'm very proud of you all and uh, we will continue to keep you updated as a uh, the next election, that's two years away, so we have some time to get ready. Well, we're in a message series called Understanding the End Times. And in this series, we're not really interested in just charting out exactly when things are going to happen and how they're going to happen so we can pinpoint things down to the day and, and pat ourselves on the back saying we understand everything and, and other people don't understand it. That's really not the purpose. Now, we want to understand the end times the last days in which we've already concluded by the Bible, we are living in the last days. The last days is the time from which Jesus ascended into heaven and when he's going to return again. So it's been going on for 2,000 plus years. We want to understand these last days in which we live so that we can live today for Jesus. So that we know what's going to happen, what's coming down uh, the track in the future. And so the prophetic teaching in the Bible is given to not just give us head knowledge about what's going to happen way off in the future. It's given to encourage us right here and now and to guide us as we uh, travel through these last days. Now today my message is entitled, Wrestling with Radical Evil. And our news reports are filled with evil, with radical evil. Well, just this morning, another American was beheaded by ISIS. And... Uh, I've been alive for a while, but I believe the evil portrayed is really the worst that I've seen. Now, I know there have been terrible wars and evil in the past, but the type and magnitude of evil that we see, and of course the, the way that 
we can access the news today is unprecedented, knowing what's going on in every corner of the earth, seeing the things that are going on. And so this is the world in which you and I live in 2014, a world that is filled with radical evil. And how can we make sense of it? What should our response to evil be? Where is the world heading? How can we be prepared? And so to introduce our topic today, first of all, I want to talk about a parable that Jesus taught. It's found in Matthew chapter 13. It's called the parable of the weeds. I'd encourage you to read it this week. Uh, we're just going to briefly talk about it here. We don't have time to read the whole thing. But the parable was that Jesus said the kingdom of God was like a man who sowed good seed in his field. And while he was sleeping, the man's enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat. And so the wheat sprouted and the weeds sprouted and they grew up together in the field. And so the field consisted of good wheat and weeds. The owner's servants wanted to pull up the weeds. But the owner said, no, don't do that because if you pull up the weeds, you're going to uproot some of the wheat. And that wouldn't work. They must grow until the harvest. Verse 30, it says, let both grow, the wheat and the weeds, until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds, tie them in bundles to be burned, then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. And so later on, Jesus then explained what the parable meant. He said the wheat refers to believers, the weeds refer to unbelievers. And the harvest is the end of, age, end of the age when the kingdom of God reaches and comes in fullness. And so you have, in the last days, in the time in which we live, you have the wheat growing and maturing, and you have the weeds sown by the enemy, who is Satan, growing and maturing at the same time. They're growing in the field of the world. Now that's a very important concept. And so the wheat are believers in the church, and we are growing in righteousness. We are growing in holiness. The church is growing across the face of the planet. The church is growing in power. Jesus said he was going to return for a spotless and beautiful church full of mature believers. And so that is going on through these last days. It has been going on, and it's going to continue. The church is alive. It's growing across the face of the planet. More people are being saved every day than ever before. On the other hand, at the very same time that the church is being purified, that the church is growing, the evil weeds are also maturing. And so the evil around us, the evil in the world, is becoming increasingly wicked. It's becoming more perverse. It's becoming much more common. And so the maturing of the weeds and the wheat happen at the same time. And so the weeds and the wheat will be an increasingly, uh, increasing spiritual warfare as the last days continue. This is not something to be discouraged about. It's something to understand. It's part of God's plan. And so the weeds are not going to take over the wheat. The church isn't going to be uh, squelched out. Nor is the church going to take over and stamp out all the weeds. They're going to grow together until when? Until the harvest, until the Lord returns again. So today we're going to be looking, with that in, as a background, we're going to be looking at a letter written by Paul to the church at Thessalonica. Paul planted the church at Thessalonica. There was intense persecution. He had to leave. Uh, and so he wrote a letter to encourage this church. Uh, this church was undergoing suffering and persecution, and they needed to be encouraged. He encouraged them in their trials by talking about what was going to happen in the future. He encouraged them by talking about the second coming of Jesus Christ. First Thessalonians 4.16, it says, he's, he wrote, For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. 
And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage each other with these words. And so these words about understanding what's going to come in the future, Jesus coming back and taking a people to be with him is meant to be an encouragement for us today as we face increasingly radical evil in our lives, just as this church in Thessalonica did. And so this aspect of the Lord's coming is commonly called the rapture. And that word comes from a Latin word which means to be caught up. This verse talks about being caught up to meet the Lord in the air. And so that coming of the Lord is the hope of every believer, and it can sustain us when life seems difficult, when we are in the midst of suffering. Now today we're going to be looking at 2 Thessalonians, a thir further revelation that God gave to this persecuted church. It will help us to prepare ourselves for what's coming in these last days in which we live. First of all, we mustn't be deceived about the day of the Lord. Our main passage today begins in chapter 2, verse 1. It says, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him, we just read about that, we ask you, brothers, not to become easily unsettled or alarmed by some prophecy, report, or letter supposed to have come from us saying that the day of the Lord has already come. And so the church of Thessalonica had received some type of report or somebody had a prophecy or a letter or something saying, the day of the Lord has already come. You missed it. And here you're being persecuted and he's already come. And so they were very discouraged. They were very downcast. They were very disheartened. They had no hope. And so Paul wrote to set things straight, to let them know that no, the day of the Lord has not yet come. It's still in the future. What is the day of the Lord? Well, in the Bible, the day of the Lord is the, is the day of two things. It's the day of God coming to rescue his people, to bring salvation to his people, and a day in which he brings judgment on the wicked. And so the day of the Lord, as we see in these verses, one and two, is, is the same as the coming of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ comes to do these two things, to gather believers to himself, and to bring judgment on the wicked. The day of the Lord is, is not a single day, but it's a period of time at the end of the last days, uh, really from the rapture of the church till the second coming of Jesus to end history. And so Paul was writing to this church, the church at Thessalonica, to explain how they could know that the day of the Lord had not yet come, that it was in the future, that they could still put their hope in Jesus returning. They could be encouraged by that. And so he wrote to encourage them as they better understood the truth about the last days. Now, we saw last Sunday that a common theme in the last days is a theme of widespread deception. And we see this even in the church of Thessalonica. They were being deceived by somebody giving an erroneous teaching, something that was not true, and they were not really grounded in God's word there, and they were being deceived and being discouraged. And as the last days continues, as the day of the Lord comes closer, the danger of deception will increase for every believer. And we must be careful not to be deceived. The truth that we are to believe as believers is that Jesus is coming again. And we ought to be expectantly awaiting. I don't think I'm speaking very broadly. The church talks enough about the second coming of Jesus Christ. It is imminent. The Bible makes it very clear. He could come at any time. We need to be ready. And that thought of him coming encourages us and focuses us on the things that are important in life. The things of eternity. When Jesus comes, it will be a wonderful fulfillment of everything that we've believed. Everything that we've worked towards. And so today we're going to look in more detail about the events surrounding the coming of Jesus Christ and the day of the Lord. We're going to better understand God's prophetic timetable. Now the deception of this church at Thessalonica by this report that they missed the day of the Lord, as we said, it led to discouragement, it led to hopelessness, and some people got all confused and they decided it wasn't worth working anymore uh, because... 
what was the point? It all was lost. And uh, the end of all things was at hand somehow. They were all confused. And so Paul wrote, uh, you know, you need to keep working. Uh, you need to provide for your family. And we've all had, there have been cases in, in recent history where people have decided Jesus is coming back on such and such a day. I'm going to quit my job and go up to a mountain and wait. And they waited and waited and he hasn't come back yet. Uh, and we are to continue doing God's work until he returns. And the Bible makes it clear we don't know the day, we don't know the hour, we don't know. Everyone's going to be surprised. But we keep on following God in these last days. Now, this passage we're going to be looking at, I'm going to look at this passage in time sequence and not in verse sequence, which has its pros and cons. Okay, So we're going to be jumping around through this passage. I'd encourage you to read the whole thing this week. Uh, and I'm going to try to, uh, I think it's helpful to put it in time sequence uh, for our understanding. The first thing we learn from this passage is the power of lawlessness is at work right now. Verse 7, first part says, For the secret, of, secret power of lawlessness is already at work. Now this was written, you know, 2,000 some years ago to the church at Thessalonica. And so this power of lawlessness is at work then, it's at work today. It's at work throughout the last days. What is lawlessness? It's the lack of law. I mean, the lack of order. It's anarchy. Lawlessness is wickedness. Lawlessness is radical evil. Lawlessness is really what sin is all about. Sin is doing what I want to do, and I don't care about any law. I don't care about God's law. I don't call, care about the country's law. I'm going to do what I want to do. And when we speak of law, we, we first think of the laws in our country. But really, when the Bible speaks of law, it speaks of the laws of God, which are absolute laws. Uh, they've always been true. They're always going to be true in this world. Now, the laws of our country, well, they're valid as long as they are consistent with God's laws. And if they're not consistent with God's laws, uh, then there's a problem with the laws of our country. But this verse says, this mystery of lawlessness, which is empowered by Satan himself, is already at work in our day, and it's increasing in power. And so don't be surprised as you see lawlessness increase in our world and in our country. Now the Holy Spirit in the, in the church is restraining evil. Verse 6 says, and now you know what is holding him, and him is the lawless one, we'll talk about him in a minute, back so that he, the lawless one, may be revealed at the proper time. And so during the present time, during these last days prior to the coming of Jesus Christ, something or someone is holding back this lawless one from being revealed. Something or someone is holding back lawlessness from running out of control. There's a restraining power holding it back. And we're going to talk more about this lawless one uh, in a minute. And Paul here says, you know what is holding him back. And <laughs> Bible scholars write volumes like, what is holding him back? And so there's a number of views of what is holding the lawlessness one back, what is restraining evil in our day. And I and many scholars believe the power restraining lawlessness and evil in the last days is the Holy Spirit in the church. Is restraining uh, evil from exploding across the face of this planet. The Bible speaks of believers and the church as being salt and light. Jesus spoke of that. Salt is something that preserves, it prevents corruption, it prevents decay. And that's one of the purposes of believers in the church. Jesus also spoke of believers as light. What does light do? It pushes back the darkness. If there was no light, the world would be enveloped in darkness. And so the light in believers, the light in the church, pushes back, holds back, restrains evil and the lawlessness that is attempting to overcome and inundate the world. How do we restrain evil? Well, there are many ways. Probably the ultimate way is to lead someone 
who is part of the kingdom of darkness to be saved. And what happens then? They're transferred from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. And so a soldier of the enemy becomes a soldier of the cross. And that's one of the important ways to restrain evil. And so the Holy Spirit in the church is restraining lawlessness, evil in our world today. What will happen as the day of the Lord begins to take place? Well, the rapture of the church will lead to an unleashing of evil. The entirety of verse 7 says, The secret power of lawlessness is already at work, but the one who now holds it back will continue to do so until, until he is taken out of the way. So I'm going to speak of the one holding back the power of lawlessness as the Holy Spirit in the church. Uh, and he's going to continue to do this until at some point in the last days he's going to be removed. Now when might that be? Well, the Holy Spirit in the church will be removed at the rapture of the church. As all the people are gathered to be with the Lord, they're removed from this earth and they'll ascend into heaven to be with Jesus. And so at that point, the church is no longer going to be a restraint on lawlessness. It's no longer going to be a restraint on evil. It's going to be unleashed in a magnitude uh, that's never been seen before. And many biblical scholars believe that the rapture of the church then will usher in a, a seven-year period called the Great Tribulation before the return of Jesus Christ in judgment. 2 Thessalonians verse 3 says, Don't let anyone deceive you in any way. Again, throughout the prophetic scriptures, don't let yourself be deceived. For that day, speaking of the day of the Lord, will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. Now remember, hope I'll get your thinking caps on today, that our passage began with the church of Thessalonica being alarmed that the day of the Lord had already come. That they'd missed it. And God here shows them that before the final day of the Lord, two things have to happen. Number one, there's a massive rebellion or outbreak of lawlessness that must occur. And number two, a specific man of lawlessness will be revealed. This man will be the personification of the power of lawlessness. He will be doomed to ultimate destruction. At the time of Paul's writing, and in our time today, these two events have not happened. And so the day of the Lord is still in the future. But I can say without a shadow of a doubt, we're 2,000 years closer than we were at the writing of the letter to the Thessalonians. After the rapture of the church, after the restraining power of the Holy Spirit is taken out of the way, the lawless one will be revealed. Verse 4, it says, He, speaking of this lawless one, will oppose and exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped, so that he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. And so this lawless one will oppose God, he'll oppose everything of God, he'll claim to be God himself. He'll be the exact opposite of Jesus Christ. In fact, other passages in the Bible give him the name, the Antichrist. That's who we're talking about. The lawless one is the Antichrist. Further verses go to describe him in more detail in verse 9. It says, The coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with the work of Satan, displayed in all kinds of counterfeit miracles, signs, and wonders. Now, if there's counterfeit, there must be the real, right? So there are real miracles, signs, and wonders that the Holy Spirit works, but Satan can work counterfeit miracles, signs, and wonders, even today. But in the coming of the lawlessness one, it's going to be pervasive. The work of Satan will be displayed in all kinds of counterfeit miracles, signs, and wonders, and in every sort of evil that deceives those who are perishing. They perish because they refuse to love the truth and be saved. And for this reason, God sends them a powerful delusion so that they will believe the lie. And so that all will be condemned who have not believed the truth, but have delighted in wickedness. And so this lawless one, the, the Antichrist, will have supernatural power, be the power of Satan, 
to work counterfeit miracles, signs, and wonders. He'll deceive those who are unbelievers to get them to worship him rather than to worship God. And this tells us that unbelievers perish because they refuse to love the truth of Jesus Christ and be saved. A truth will be made available to them, but they refuse to believe it. They delight in the wickedness of the lawless one. And finally, how is this all going to end? Well, Jesus is going to return and destroy the lawless one. Verse 8. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will overthrow with the breath of his mouth and destroy by the splendor of his coming. And so at the very end of this great tribulation, of this great lawlessness, of this reign of terror by the lawless one, by the Antichrist, Jesus Christ will appear in power and glory at the very end of the tribulation and destroy him and his armies. He'll bring judgment and usher in a worldwide rule of Jesus Christ uh, called the millennium in which believers rule and reign with him. Now, God has not revealed to us all the details of his prophetic timeline. And anybody who studied prophecy seriously uh, must be humble and realize there are many unanswered questions. God has not promised to answer all our questions about the future, but he's given enough to understand what's going to happen and how it should encourage us and help us to live today for Jesus Christ. I might say the things that are going to happen are really clear. I've given you kind of a broad outline of the order. That is not as clear. And there are people who disagree on the order of these things happening. But that's not so important as long as we know they are going to happen. We can be encouraged by what is going to happen in the future. So what's the take-home message of this prophetic timeline we've talked about this morning. Well, evil and lawlessness are going to continue to increase. And so let's not go down the plug hole and pull our hair out. What is this world coming to? You know, doesn't God see? Yes, he sees. This is part of his plan. It's going to increase. But believers filled with the Holy Spirit are the restraining power that holds back this evil. And we have opportunities to tell people in the midst of this evil, people are going to turn to God. In fact, in the video we showed, was it last Sunday, in Syria, many Muslims were turning to the Lord Jesus Christ because of the awful evil being perpetrated by ISIS. They just couldn't believe this was really their God, Allah, doing this and said, this, this can't be a true religion. And they've turned and given their hearts to Jesus Christ. So in the midst of evil, people are going to be drawn to become believers to Jesus Christ. And no matter how evil may get in our lives or even in our country or in our world, we know the end of the story. Jesus is going to come back. He's going to take us to be with him forever. And he's going to judge all evil. That's a pretty good ending, isn't it? I like that ending. We know the end. And we can be encouraged and encourage others with that end. And so even as we wrestle with increasingly radical evil in our world, we must trust in God's protection. As we walk in God's will, as we walk in God's plan, God protects us. Verse 13, we ought always to thank God for you, brothers loved by the Lord, because from the beginning God chose you to be saved through the sanctifying work of the Spirit and through belief in the truth. The God is saying to us, He loves us. He loves you. If you're a believer here this morning, He chose you to be saved. The Holy Spirit lives inside of you. He's given you the truth of His Word to encourage you, to guide you, to comfort you. And as we follow Jesus, we're not going to be deceived as we stand firm on the truth of God's Word. Verse 14, he called you to this through our gospel, that you might share in the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. And when are we going to share in that glory? When he comes again. So then, brothers, stand firm. Underline those two words, stand firm. Hold to the teachings we passed on to you, whether by word or mouth or by letter. Stand firm on God's word. Don't be deceived by other things, by people telling you other things or 
other prophecies, you know, pretty much every cult is based on some other prophecy other than God's word, and people have been deceived and led astray. Stand firm on the word of God. Even though many distort it, many contradict it, in these days, God's truth is the foundation on which we must live. We don't live by following our feelings. We don't live by following the crowd. We live by God's word. And those who stand firm on that truth are destined to share in Jesus' glory at the end of time. Whatever you're going through today, God wants you to receive his encouragement. Verse 16, may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who loved us and by his grace gave us eternal encouragement and good hope encourage your hearts and strengthen you in every good deed and word. And so God wants to encourage every person here this morning. Stand firm. Don't give up. Don't stop working. God wants to strengthen you for every good word and every good deed. He's got words he wants you to speak to other people this coming week. Words of encouragement, words of truth. Words that would lead people closer to Jesus Christ. He's got deeds he wants you to do, good works. He wants you to accomplish for him in this coming week. This morning, receive God's encouragement. For those of you this morning who are believers, you're a soldier of the kingdom of God, and you're at war with the kingdom of darkness. These last days are a period of warfare. You're wrestling with radical evil. And in these last days, that conflict is going to increase in fierceness. Evil will grow worse, and yet many will be won to the kingdom of God. There'll be many opportunities for people to turn to the Lord Jesus Christ. And those who stand firm to the end will not only be saved, but will lead many to righteousness. And so God wants you to be encouraged, and he wants you to be an encourager of others. When you see the bad news, don't grumble, don't complain. Point people to Jesus. He's the good news, the good news of the gospel. And so this morning, will you commit with me to standing firm on God's word in these last days? Together, we can see God do great things through our lives and through our church. Let your light shine each and every day. Drive back the darkness and overcome evil with good. To become part of the kingdom of God, you must commit your life to the lordship of Jesus Christ. He's the king of kings. He's the Lord of lords. I'd like to ask you all to bow your heads right now. And today, if you're not sure... that you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, if you're not sure that you've submitted your life to Him, I'd encourage you to pray with me. And perhaps you've prayed in the past or you've made some type of commitment in the past, but you've drifted away. You've, you may be going your own way, which the Bible calls sin, and, and you want to come back. I'd encourage you to recommit your life by praying this prayer again. Say something like this. Father, today I admit that I've sinned. I've done wrong things. I've lived a selfish life. I've followed my own plans. Please forgive me. I believe that Jesus Christ came to this earth, lived a perfect life, died on the cross that my sins might be forgiven. Come into my life. I commit myself to following you, to following your direction, to following your word all the days of my life, and I look forward to your return that I might live with you forever and ever. And for those who are believers, let's pray that God would help us as well. Father, we thank you for preparing us for what's going to happen in the future. We, we thank you, God, that you're going to be with us. You promise never to leave us or forsake us. Even though we're wrestling with increasingly radical evil, you are with us and you protect us and you guide us. We're grateful, God, that, that when all things are said and done, when history is over, when the end comes, that Jesus Christ will be the victor. 
And as believers, we're going to stand with him. We're going to share in his glory forever and ever. Help us, God, to remain true to you to the end. Help us to grow in our understanding of your word, God, so that we won't fall into deception. Help us and teach us to be better witnesses for you so that we can rescue many who are lost and wandering in the evil of this world. God, we pray that you would help our church, Life Church, to shine your truth, God, in increasing ways to the people around us that this light might pierce the darkness that enshrouds so much of St. Louis. We pray, God, in the coming days, and you know what's going to happen, we don't know. Uh, we pray, God, that your truth and your gospel would advance even in the midst of lawlessness, even in the midst of riots, civil disturbances, whatever else may be coming, we pray that your church would shine your light and that people would be drawn to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.